Now, being prepared for a power outage, whether that's several hours, days, or even weeks, is something we should be working through as a homeowner. Now, there is a size class of natural gas generators, gas generators, or even portable power stations that would be a backup for your whole home. But today, let's talk about a smaller system that would really be running your critical appliances. Now, we need to understand what are critical appliances, how to assess what kind of power needs those have, how much energy would they consume daily, and then how to right size a system, maybe like these two here, which is the EcoFlow Delta II or the Delta III Plus. So we're gonna be matching up to power and energy for this portable power station. If you were doing just a gas generator, power is really what you're looking at, both on continuous and surge perspective. Energy, that's coming from your gas, so you're gonna to have to keep filling up the gas tank, but it is not as critical as when you have a power station with batteries. But first up, let's understand your power consumers, which would be those critical loads or your critical appliances. For me, that would be the fridge, so that's gonna be a refrigerator freezer combo. For me, sump pump is critical. If this was uh, rain in the spring, it knocks out through a th thunderstorm, knocks down some power poles. I might have some water coming in my basement into the sump pit. I need to get that out or I have huge problems. So that is a critical load for me. And then this is a gas furnace. So most of the energy consumption from the gas furnace to create heat in the winter, again, maybe it's an ice storm, maybe it drops that temperature the next day. So I wanna keep my house nice and warm from a comfort level, but also make sure the pipes don't freeze. I'm gonna use gas furnace. Gas is gonna heat the home, but we still need to both run the, the overall circuit board, the inducer fan, but also your big blower motor to spread that heat throughout your house. So those are my loads. So now we need to start to identify so we can add these up both on the power perspective and energy perspective. Power perspective is gonna be on the maximum or continuous draw, but not necessarily surge. We'll talk a little bit about surge and what we need to account for. Now for your refrigerator freezer, the best way you can understand this is make a small investment and get yourself one of these power meters. This you can plug directly into the wall. I have two extension cords going in because I'm doing some testing on the fridge now, but you can plug this directly in the wall and then just plug your appliance that you're testing, here would be the refrigerator freezer, into the front. And then that's gonna give you your parameters there. Here we're running at about 80 watts to run the fridge freezer combo. Now that is going to fluctuate over time and it's gonna go up and down substantially depending on what cycle. Your defrost cycle is gonna be your worst case scenario, but this meter can actually document the high and low power consumption. So you will encapsulate that. And for here, this was about 290 watts was as high as it got. So at any given time, 290 watts is gonna be the maximum power for my combo here. So mark 290. That is not gonna be the continuous. It's not 24 hours a day pulling that. That is gonna be our maximum at any given time. Worst case, 290 watts could be pulled by a refrigerator freezer combo. Now I did that same test for a 24 hour period, kept that power meter plugged in, and this one is a kilowatt meter, it does the same thing, but it's about twice as expensive. So you can see a link in the description for the one I recommend that I've used over multiple different tests, and it'll work perfectly for you for under $20. But what we got from that is over a 24 hour period, our energy consumption was 900 watt hours for this fridge freezer combo. So this is gonna be one of our three factors that I need to add up. Now my sump pump, I've done testing in the past as well. Sump pumps can be a little tricky, right? Because sump pumps are gonna be cyclical. They're gonna turn on and off depending on how much water is going into the sump pit. And this is gonna vary widely to the time of year, how much rain you have, and just overall where your house is located. Now, again, I recommend using the power meter and plugging your sump pump in and run it for one day or maybe multiple days to get an understanding of, okay, how frequently is this gonna run? Because for instance, my power that I concern for my sump pump can go as high as 800 watts but that is obviously not gonna be continuous. If that was continuous, we would be burning 800 watt hours of energy in just one hour. Now I've tested that over a 24 hour period and this was a very frequently running day. A lot of water was going into the pit 
and that ends up equal 1,065 watt hours of energy consumed in a 24 hour period. For me, I'm comfortable with that because that was about the worst case scenario where that sump pump was running very, very frequently to get the water out of the pit and away from the house. And then finishing it off with the gas furnish, which is my largest energy consumer when I measured that over a 24 hour period. Now this will vary dramatically depending on your outside temperature, what you're setting your inside thermostat temperature to. You can really fluctuate this up or down with some of those variables. For me, I was setting the thermostat to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's about 25 degrees Fahrenheit outside during this testing. So what I measured was 2,400 watt hours of energy consumed during that 24 hour period. And then during startup, I would have a power draw of 850 watts for my furnace. Again, all of our furnaces are gonna be different and some of those factors you might need to pay attention to. If it was negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside and you're trying to set your house to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you can see how this energy consumption is gonna go way up because your furnace is gonna to continue to run all day long. So take that into account. So for our powers, bringing those all together, I have 1940 watts. It's gonna be my maximum if all those were on at the same time. Now, when you run the portable power station, you'll see most likely it's running at 500 or 400 watts or even lower at any given time. So it just matters which one of these are on and how many are on at the same time. And then my energy now brought together is 4365 watt hours for a 24 hour period powering these three critical appliances. Now, if you're looking to do just a gas generator and not a portable power station as your source of power, just take this and basically round up to 2000 watts. Now that's gonna be 2000 watts that I would use as a continuous load. That's gonna give you buffer most of the time, no problem. But then I would want a little bit more surge capacity. And that's because things like the compressor on our fridges will have a little bit of a momentary spike as they start up. And you just wanna make sure you have a little bit of surge capability so you're not tripping a circuit breaker on your gas generator and then always having to go out and reset it or maybe turn off some of your critical appliances so the one fridge could start. It is just nice to have that little bit of buffer. So maybe even size out or into the 3000 watt range. And remember, our standard gas generator is gonna be cheaper but an inverter generator is gonna run smoother, more efficiently, and usually much quieter. So take that into account, and don't forget, Harbor Freight has some pretty good generators, so that's something to look at for a reasonable price. So what about portable power stations? We need to take into account the power and also the energy needs here when we're sizing that out and trying to fit that, and then also, how are we gonna fill up that battery? What about the solar side of the equation? So for portable power stations, I've been teaming up with EcoFlow for years, both on everyday home repairs, but also on our other channel called Everyday Solar. We do a ton of different projects and use these portable power stations across a lot of those. Now, I just brought this big guy in here. This is the EcoFlow Delta Pro 3. This is more than capable of running our use case here. So this has about 4,000 watts of output, AC output capability. Obviously can easily meet, let's just round our load up to 2,000 watts of need that we had. And then also has a 4,000 watt hour battery so with some solar input, we're gonna easily be able to charge this up, make it through the night, and then continue to go in a 24 hour multiple day scenario, maybe multi-week scenario. This can bring in 2,600 watts of solar across two different charge controllers, but it costs thousands and thousands of dollars and it's 114 pounds. So it's not as easy to lug around your house. So that's where I like these when it comes to critical loads. This one's a little bit more along the lines of a whole home backup system. So this is the Delta II. This has been the one I've recommended for years for critical loads, like running your refrigerator. The challenge with this Delta II, the price point's great. Sometimes you can get this around the $500, $600 range, but it has 1,800 watts of output up to 2,700 watts of surge. So it could put out the power we need. It's a little close, but it could put out that power. It only has a 1,000 watt hour battery. So we're gonna burn through that pretty quick with this application as we need, we'll round it again to around 4,500 watt hours of overall energy for a 24 hour period. The biggest thing you could say, well, maybe you run solar and, and charge up that battery, and offset that consumption during the day. Well, this only has 500 watts of input capability. So even on a perfect day, you're gonna bring in 500 watts. That's not gonna be enough to offset it. 
So the same size class is about 28 pounds for these units, the Delta III Plus, this new unit here and the Delta II. So it's much more portable, much easier to bring to different rooms in your house. And that's one of the main advantages over a gas generator is you're gonna have these inside your house. They're gonna be portable, you can move them around. Worst case scenario, if you can't get the solar, you could throw these in your car, go to a part of town or a powder your county that has power and charge them up bring them back, get your sump pump back on, get your fridge back on, get your furnace back on. So you have some different capabilities. But why this Delta III Plus could most likely run this scenario, it has 1800 watts out like the Delta II, so it can handle the power output and it surges all the way up to 3600 watts. So we will be able to handle our power demands. It only has that one kilowatt hour battery. So what would we need to do in that case? We could grab an additional battery now that's going to give you a little more cost, but it's very easy to plug in right in the back and the wire management's better on the Delta 3s and the Delta 2s. Now I have 2000 watt hours of overall battery capacity here. And why this would work much better than the Delta 2 is because we have two different charge controllers, each of those being 500 watts. So right now I have four panels out in my yard, just sitting on sawhorses, super temporary mount. Each of those two is wired in parallel, and then two goes into each side. So I have two running in one of the 500 watt charge controllers, and then two running in the other side. This is technically called over paneling. So in a perfect scenario condition, those panels could produce much more, but the charge controllers will throttle that down to 1000 watts. So I'm really gonna be pushing that maximum solar throughout a bigger part of the day. And I'll be getting in sunny conditions, I'll be getting thousand watts for over four hours that day. So that'd be 4,000 watt hours fully charging the batteries up. But then in the morning and at night, it's gonna trail off. Like right now we're trailing off, but we're still getting 870 watts in. So I could crank my furnace during the day, make sure the fridge is running, make sure the sump's running and run any other loads during the day when I have extra solar. And then the 2000 watt hours is probably just gonna get me through the night, especially if I heat up my home during the day and then drop that thermostat at night so the furnace isn't running that much. So I'll put the links in the description right below this video for all these different units. Again, I recommend on my specific application, the Delta III Plus, I think price to capability is a good match. If you wanna see other portable power stations out there, my friend Josh did put a tool together. You can see that link in the description, and that is where you can put your critical appliance loads together and kind of mix and match your different loads and even do custom devices. And then that will down select what portable power stations are on the market and which ones fit your need from an inverter perspective. So that'll open up, okay, are there other brands or models that would work for me in terms of your very specific application? So I do understand this can be like drinking from a fire hose if you don't know much about portable power stations, solar panels. So a few more videos to help you out. This video right here will walk you through how to wire solar panels together. Series, parallel, and series parallel will give you different configurations to better match your panels to your portable power station and also help you understand things like open circuit voltage on your panel and short circuit current, which are two critical parameters you need to know. And then if you want a semi-permanent mount for those panels for this type of scenario, with a few brackets from Amazon, some T-Post and two by fours, you can put this semi-permanent mount together in just an hour or so and get those panels set up. So thanks for joining me on this video and we'll catch you on one of those next ones. Take care.